Black Op Radio presents 50 Reasons for 50 Years. Why the Warren Commission may be the greatest fraud perpetrated on the American public. Now your host, Len Osanek. In this, the 50th episode of our series, we examine perhaps the greatest failing of the Warren Commission, that to honestly investigate the true enemies of JFK. That search has to include those opposed to his foreign policy. There were those surrounding JFK who were seriously threatened by his moves for peace, that threatened the industrialized military complex that President Eisenhower warned of. That included the Joint Staff, which had proposed Operation Northwoods, among other things. The CIA was to be smashed into a thousand pieces. And according to the National Security Act of 1947, the CIA works directly for the National Security Council, who was not too happy with the proposed demise of CIA. Every American should read the Dulles Jackson Korea report of 1949 to see of Alan Dulles' plans for his CIA. The National Security Council initiates, plans, and reacts to the foreign policy of the United States. But this is just another area that the President had strong opposition. Director, producer, Oliver Stone discusses JFK's foreign policy and how it was at odds with the establishment. Corporate and military of the United States in 1963. This is Oliver Stone. In light of what I've been doing the last five years with the Untold History of the United States, which was a Showtime series that is now out on Blu-rays, we looked at Kennedy without looking at the assassination. If you look at the Eisenhower regime and then you look at the Johnson regime after it, it really stands out. And people have not given him credit enough for the differences. Some people say out the last year especially, but I would say from 1960 onward. There's no question that he was a cold warrior because he had to be at that time. You can't be soft on communism in 1960 and go against the last 13 years of the tide of American life. No, you can't. But Kennedy is definitely trying to keep his humanistic impulses. He had been to Vietnam, he'd been to, he, he knew the Algerian war situation with the French, and he, he condemned colonialism uh, very strongly and had done so as a younger man. His decision to neutralize and fuzz up the ocean situation was as severe next time as the Vietnam situation. And Eisenhower wanted to go in. He advised him to go in, as did the Joint Chiefs. But he, he fuzzed it up and came up with a neutralist solution. But it was a very difficult road for him to you between these forces that were pressing on him to continue the American build-up, continue the American line. In Berlin, he had a hard job, but as he once said famously, you know, it's a wall, meaning the Berlin Wall, is better than a war because we were that close to war in 1961. It was a very cold year, 61. 62 only got worse because the, the effort, and Kennedy in part was responsible for it, to dislodge Cuba, which was only 90 miles away with a communist regime from the United States. So there was this desire to get rid of him at the same time. The thing got out of hand. By the time the Russians put their missiles in because they figured that the United States was going to invade Cuba, Kennedy found himself on a tuning fork. He, he was in a very tough situation. And there's no question that if it had been Obama in the presidency or Nixon or Johnson or Reagan, we would have gone to war in October 62. That is the difference between Kennedy and those men. Kennedy was, seems to me, closer to a man like Roosevelt in his grand vision and his generosity of vision. He saw the war coming. He saw the deaths. He saw the PSYOP plans that Eisenhower had drawn up and left, calling for, you know, nuclear strikes that would kill about 600 million people in the world. Our position was we would take out red communist China at the same time as Russia. If we ever had to go to a conventional war, we would avoid it. And, in fact, in the heart of the missile crisis, we found that the bombers on Okinawa were lit up and ready to go with hydrogen bombs were over China. So this was a full-scale plan, and it could have easily have gone out of hand because we had the submarine crisis, which we showed in our chapter on Untold History with Arkhipov. We have a shoot-down of the U-2. We have false messages going to Washington throughout that crisis about attacks on various cities. We also have with Thomas Powers in the Air Force going to a DEFCON 2 situation without checking with anybody. He just goes to DEFCON 2. We remain at DEFCON 2 throughout the crisis, whereas the Soviets don't even go to that level. So... At this point, the Joint Chiefs are really thinking, especially LeMay, that this is a moment to go. We can take the Russians. We're obviously much stronger than they are at this point. We have a 10 to 1 parity. We are much stronger. We have 30,000, something like that, 3,000 or 2,000 nuclear weapons. So we figure we can suffer. We can sustain the retaliation that will come. This is a very important 
note to this crisis. In that mood, I mean, Kennedy has attested to it, and Robert Kennedy, and all the aides, Kenny O'Donnell, etc., the mood was one for war. Eisenhower himself advised to go into Cuba. McNamara, years later, said that we did not know. He found out afterward when he traveled the world. He found out that in Cuba there was 40,000 trained Russian troops with 100 nuclear battlefield weapons. Hundred. Our estimates were much lower than that. We didn't know all the kinds of missiles. Our U-2s had only revealed a certain portion of the missiles that they had. They also were commanded by an active Stalingrad commander, which is an amazing story. McNamara said they were estimating 20,000 casualties on the invasion, but McNamara later said we would have had 100,000 casualties. In which case, it would really have gotten out of hand and uh, no doubt would have led to a thermonuclear war and perhaps a winter. Kennedy sensed that this was getting out of hand, and so did Khrushchev. Thank God that they were still communicating through Dobrynin and Robert Kennedy. And through that last Saturday night, it was the most scary night, I, back in my arms, I said I'd never thought I'd see another Saturday night on the Potomac again. That Sunday dawned with mercy, and uh, Khrushchev backed down and started to talk, and they made a deal to save this situation, because both Khrushchev and Kennedy knew that the hardliners in both their camps were going to get out of line on this. We're getting out of line. We're very lucky just to be here with this world, this civilized world that we had, and people forget that. And over the course of the next year, essentially, Kennedy and Khrushchev signed a limited test ban treaty, which is the first time we ever have a, any kind of nuclear test ban treaty in these 14, 15 years since the Cold War. They agreed to uh, call off the space race, which was a very important thing. Uh, that Kennedy said it, they wanted to go to space together, and of course he said in his American University speech, which was, I think, the greatest speech a president's ever given in this century, he said, calls for the end of the Cold War, and he says, what, what kind, kind of a peace, peace do I mean, and what kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war, not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave, I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on Earth worth living. And he pays homage. He's the first American president since World War II, since Roosevelt, to pay homage to the Soviet Union's contribution to World War II, where basically they took on the German army. Among the many traits the peoples of our two countries have in common, none is stronger than our mutual abhorrence of war. It took an enormous amount of debt, more than 20 million. Like 25, 27, the U.S. took 400,000 casualties. They wiped out five, six of the German army and were devastated and broke after World War II. And Kennedy, in this beautiful speech, outlined all of that. We never heard it from an American president. We never sensed from an American president any degree of compassion or understanding for the life of others, for China, for Russia. Even when Gorbachev made his tremendous contributions of the later to world peace, offering the United States an olive branch, Reagan never said anything particularly kind about the past because he didn't know the history of the Soviet Union. Kennedy represents a, a sea change in the last 50 years of American life. And when you see Johnson come in on November 23, what I grew up believing, you know, the mainstream media keep telling us, was essentially was a continuation of the policies of Kennedy to more effect and that Kennedy would have stayed in Vietnam, etc. But we completely disagree with that, and we dispute it in our history. He was the last truly peacekeeper of American presidents after Roosevelt, and uh, it's a shame because it's gone. It was gone in Dallas that day. Too many people had too much going with the Cold War, and they wanted it to continue. And they also feared that Kennedy, if, because he was popular for these positions, very popular, and he would have won re-election in 64. If he'd been re-elected, he would have gone much further. And in 68, of course, you have the prospect of Robert Kennedy. So you have a Kennedy dynasty, but I think that's very frightening you know, to people who literally hate his guts from I mean, the military and, and hate this family with such a passion. And, and also you saw it in the signs of the time in the South, in the posters, in the, the races, they hated him for being young, for being, they thought, pro-black, and they thought that he was a coward, soft on conscience. So it's a sick country which did that to him. And what's sick is that on top of it, the cover-up goes on and on and on. Fifty years later, all our mainstream media now, with all the leading uh, intelligent people of our media society, because they don't want to step out of line, all saying now that uh, Oswald did it alone, but they're ignoring the evidence. This evidence is with your own eyes and your own common sense. It's really a shame that this country has chickened out. The Warren Commission was appointed quickly and was a cover job. 
I would not call it a fraud because I don't believe Earl Warren was a fraud. I think he's a good man. I think Russell and many of the people on it were good people. And I don't even think that Hoover was as bad as people make him out to be because I think a lot of the good evidence does come from early FBI work. But the issue with that is why appoint the man who Kennedy uh, fired uh, to the commission, that's uh, Alan Dulles, who had been humiliated by Kennedy. And Dulles, when you get into it, seemed to control a lot of what was going on and what was being given to Warren and, and the commission and what was read into the files and the lawyers and the appointees and so forth. He also does not make available the CIA files that are really important on Oswald and on these other characters to the commission, although there's plenty of people who are talking about them already at that point. Dulles is the fox and the chicken coop here. So the Warren Commission cannot be trusted. On the evening of the assassination, a Philadelphia lawyer named Vincent Salandra made a prediction. If the arrested man presented as a lone assassin survived the weekend, it could be assumed he was indeed responsible. If, however, Oswald was killed while in custody, then responsibility for the assassination could be understood as residing at the highest levels of the U.S. establishment. Vincent Salandria produced some of the earliest and best articles critical of the Warren Commission. He also argued it was best to use a big picture lens to view the assassination, that the events and the details of the day produced a false mystery, because the identity of the ultimate sponsors of the murder was obvious all along. Author David Radcliffe in his astounding interviews with Colonel Fletcher Prouty resulted in Understanding Special Operations, which reveals much of the U.S. secret black budget military from 1955 to 1964. Dave Radcliffe was also influenced by the work of Philadelphia lawyer Vincent Salandria and has this to add. My name is David Radcliffe from Boston. The following is an excerpt of Vincent Salandria's 1998 address to the Coalition on Political Assassinations. Theodore H. White, in his book, The Making of the President, 1964, told us that on the afternoon of November 22, 1963, the presidential party on Air Force One, quote, learned that there was no conspiracy, learned of the identity of Oswald and his arrest, unquote. In correspondence with me, Mr. White stated that his message was sent to the presidential party from the Situation Room of the White House. The same message was confirmed by Pierre Salinger in his book, With Kennedy. Mr. Salinger received that same message while on a cabinet plane, which was flying over the Pacific Ocean. Mr. Salinger tried to get those data to me and had instructed the National Archives to provide them, but they disappeared from the National Archives. My inquiries to the White House Communications Agency requesting a copy of the Air Force One tapes were dismissed in a letter by James Cross, Armed Forces aide to the President. He wrote that the logs and tapes of the radio transmissions, quote, are kept for official use only. These tapes are not releasable, nor are they obtainable from commercial sources. But the contents of this message to Air Force One was confirmed in 1993 by Robert Manning, Kennedy's Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs who was on the presidential plane on its return trip from Love Field to Andrews Air Force Base. He reported having heard the same account of Oswald being designated as the presumed assassin. That, my good people, is conclusive evidence of high-level U.S. governmental guilt. The first announcement of Oswald as the lone assassin before there was any evidence against him, and while there was overwhelmingly convincing evidence of conspiracy, had come from the White House Situation Room. Only the assassins could have made that premature declaration that Oswald was the assassin. This announcement had been made while back in Dallas. District Attorney Henry Wade was stating that, quote, preliminary reports indicated more than one person was involved in the shooting, unquote. Can there be any doubt that for any innocent government taken by surprise by the assassination and legitimately seeking the truth concerning it, the White House Situation Room message was sent too soon? The government could not have known at that time that Oswald was the killer and that there was no conspiracy. On November 22, 1963, McGeorge Bundy, the president's assistant for national security affairs, had been in direct control of the White House Situation Room. Bundy was a hardliner on foreign policy. He had been a student of CIA's covert operations chief, Richard Bissell, who had been fired by President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. In 1948, Bundy had worked for Bissell on the Marshall Plan. Bundy was a man of considerable intelligence, 
He did not, out of stupidity, inform the presidential party that Oswald was the lone assassin before there was any evidence against him and while there was compelling evidence of conspiracy. At Bundy's direction, instructions were given to the party on the presidential plane and on the cabinet plane. What they had heard, smelled, and seen in Dealey Plaza was of no consequence. The Patsy had been selected, and the conclusion of conspiracy had been ruled out. Bundy was indirectly instructing the presidential party and the cabinet members that he was speaking for the killers. He was directing the presidential party and the cabinet that what they had observed in Dealey Plaza was merely evidence, and that the needs of state rose above evidence. He was informing the presidential party that those among them who had witnessed the triangulation of fire which had brought down the president should not imagine that a few nuts in Dealey Plaza had gotten lucky. They were being circuitously informed that the assassination had been committed by a level of U.S. power that was above and beyond punishment. Bundy, in the service of our warfare state, and the U.S. establishment of which he was an honored member, committed the crime of being an obstructor of justice and was a critical accessory after the fact to the murder of our president. Bundy was rewarded for his brazen cover-up work by remaining with President Johnson as one of his leading hawkish advisors on Vietnam. This preeminent establishment man was, in my judgment, unquestionably criminally involved, at least in the cover-up of the assassination of President Kennedy. He owed his allegiance to the U.S. establishment, the murderers of the president. The Kennedy assassination retains its hold in the public imagination because it's still an open case. And along with accessories after the fact, there were accessories before the fact. When the FBI ended its investigation after 24 hours, declaring Lee Oswald the sole killer, leads which may have led to the real shooting teams were closed off prematurely and vital clues were never followed up. One such clue can be found in the Dallas police radio logs less than 15 minutes after shots in Dealey Plaza. In response to a tip, police inspector Sawyer broadcast the first description of a potential assassin, a white male, about 30, 5 foot 10, 165 pounds. Lee Oswald, of course, is 5 foot 8, 131 pounds. But what was really strange was that any assassin firing from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository would have had to crouch or kneel at the window. How could anyone from street level determine a shooter's height and weight? And the source of this description was never identified. Someone reported this to the police and then disappeared. Decades later, as files were released through the JFK Records Act, researchers noticed a curious detail. In numerous files generated by the CIA's counterintelligence office written before the assassination, Oswald's physical description appeared as 5 foot 10, 165 pounds. So, what does that all mean? That the CIA had paperwork with 165 pound Lee Oswald that was leaked and traces back to the CIA from before the assassination. As I mentioned, the source of this description was never identified. Someone reported it to the police and then disappeared. My research has led to Alan Dulles' top man, Ed Lansdale. Marine General Victor Krulak wrote a letter to Colonel Fletcher Prouty identifying Lansdale in Dealey Plaza that day. Lansdale was a master of psychological warfare. If Lansdale worked for Alan Dulles, who did Alan Dulles work for and who did he represent? Oliver Stone spoke of JFK's foreign policy as a main area of opposition. It's interesting that Lansdale retired from his general position in the Pentagon a month before the assassination then, right after, started working for the CARE organization, getting U.S. interest into third world countries on the ground floor before the communists could. This brings us back to the covert and intelligence agencies of the U.S. government. Dulles hated the Kennedys. Hoover hated the Kennedys. Lyndon Johnson hated the Kennedys. U.S. Steel, Texas Oil, NASA, the Joint Chiefs. If you continue the research, you will find JFK was removed by his enemies in a coup d'etat. The evidence here is so overwhelming, if you look with common sense, you will see it is a false mystery. If you need more proof, demand the files be released. They are hidden because they are so damning, and if they showed evidence of a lone assassin, you can bet they would have been waved around years ago. Locked up for 75 years. Come on, this is a false mystery. 75 years? I'll close this series with a quote from Colonel Fletcher Prouty. 
I asked Fletcher that when he left for the South Pole, the Vietnam operations were being shut down. But by the time he got back to the Pentagon, offices that were empty weeks before were now full. It was full speed ahead for war plans in Southeast Asia. I asked, with the best and the brightest still working in the Defense Department, the Bundys, McNamara, Katzenbach, Nitze, all these smart men working there had to suspect something was wrong. Many of them had to know it was a coup. I asked him, how many do you think really knew? He quietly looked down and said to me in a very somber tone, they all knew. Thank you for watching 50 Reasons for 50 Years.